it's, it's a season of birthdays. So this year, it's the 40th anniversary of the University Institute. This year is also the 20th anniversary of the Marie Skłodowska Curie actions, the research and mobility. Next year, it will be the 30th anniversary of the Erasmus program. Lots of, uh, lots of um, birthdays uh, all in one go. And I think it's a good time to look back and to see where we've come from and also to see how much progress we've made. I should mention also that in 2018, of course, it will be the 20th anniversary of the Bologna process also. So lots of educational and research birthdays um, uh, at the moment. Manuel Marin this morning um, recalled the very, very strong opposition that there was from some countries to the very idea of cooperation on education and training. He mentioned how difficult it was to get agreement on the recognition of diplomas between different countries. And as you were talking, Commissioner, I have to call you that, as you were talking, I thought to myself, you could be talking about now. It's not actually so different. When I'm talking in the Education Committee of the Council or in the official groups in the Bologna process, I get just the same arguments coming back. Education is a fundamental responsibility and competence of the member states, or in some cases of regions within those member states. Why on earth is Europe getting involved? I think probably all of us in this room here know why. I think we know that every country has an interest in the educational performance of its neighbors. We all benefit from highly educated populations in our own country and abroad. They are the basis for sustainable and peaceful development in the world. So it's absolutely essential that we do everything we can to improve the quality of education wherever that might be, whether it's in Europe or in the developing world or in newly industrializing countries, it doesn't matter. We must invest in that. And that's why the Commission has, over the years, developed different ways of working with education stakeholders, with ministries, with um, associations of universities, universities individually themselves, why we developed, of course, as Howell very clearly um, recalled this morning, the Erasmus program and the impact that Erasmus has had. Commissioner Marine, you shouldn't really have admitted that in public, that Erasmus was about taking competence from the member states. It's the sort of the, the untold secret behind the program. But it certainly has done that. We all know that without Erasmus, the Bologna process wouldn't exist. We all know that without Erasmus, we wouldn't have the European credit and transfer system. And Sasha, I think it is one of the great successes of Europe that the member states now use this system as though it were their own. In that way, our job is done. So I'm very, very pleased that that, is, that that has happened. I'm one of the rare European officials who doesn't mind if I don't always get the credit for these things. But let's look a little bit also now at the future and look at the, at the, at the challenges. And let's look at also some of the positive things. Because the expansion of higher education that we have seen over the last 30 years is a fantastic success. We're at a situation now where nearly 40% of young people in Europe have a higher education qualification. They have had the benefits of a university education which makes them think differently, which makes them more open, which makes them more um, interculturally aware. And that can only be a positive thing. But we know that at the same time, that increase in the number of students that we have 
brings with it very many problems. Very many problems and challenges for our university systems. We have very many pockets of excellence in Europe. We have some of the best higher education institutions in the world. But we also know that not every student gets the value that he or she should from their higher education experience. We know that there are graduates who end up in unemployment, who have not been supported in the way that they need to be supported by their higher education systems because they come from different backgrounds, because they haven't had the academic training they need before they get to university to be able to take advantage of it, for example. And we know also that universities find it very difficult to keep up with the changes in the labor market. Mr. Kalecha this morning said that the children who are going into primary school now, 60% of them will end up in jobs that have not even been invented. But even the time scale is often even shorter than that. We know there was a study in Helsinki back in 2009, for example, which tried to identify the 10 most in-demand jobs in the Helsinki area. And they tried to adapt the programs at the university to meet that demand. It takes five years, more or less, in, in the Finnish system to train somebody for those jobs. Five years later, in 2014, not one of those jobs was in the top 10. Not one. So it's very, very difficult for higher education institutions to try to predict the future, to try to adapt their courses to the labor market. So we need to be very careful about what we mean when we say we should focus on employability and making students job ready. What we do need to do is to make sure that all of our graduates have what is being called these days a high level of T-shaped skills so that you have depth in your discipline but that you also have horizontal skills, transversal skills, problem solving, critical thinking, analysis, you know, all of these teamwork and communication skills, languages, all of these things which enable you to be successful in the labor market and to adapt to those changes. Now our curricula in many of our universities are not delivering that at the moment. We carried out a public consultation earlier on this year where we asked universities and academics in universities and students and organizations, stakeholder organizations and governments what they thought about the curricula in universities. And what they told us was that around half of the students who responded felt that their university course was not helping them to develop these transversal skills. And I thought that was quite surprising until I went to a meeting of the Coimbra group not very long ago, talking to some of the rectors, and I gave them this statistic expecting them to react and say, no, no, this is not true, all of our universities are doing this. And in fact, the reaction was quite the opposite. The reaction was, yeah, we know. We know this is a problem. And when we're talking about Coimbra, we're talking about some of the best research universities in Europe. So imagine what's happening in some of the others. We also need to improve the, the feedback that we get from graduates, the knowledge that we have about what happens to our graduates. Now, in lots of countries, they do graduate surveys. In some other countries, they have um, administrative information, so they're able to track graduates um, into the labor market and find out what happens to them on the basis of their tax number or their social security number, something like that. What we're not able to do at the moment is to compare those experiences across countries because the approach which is taken in different countries is very, very different. So at the moment, we're not really able to say 
whether there are any higher education systems in Europe which do this job better than others. We know that there are different rates of, of graduate employment. What we don't know is how much that is linked to the economic cycle, how much it's linked to the mismatch between the quality of the education and the needs of the labor market. We need to do a lot more work on that, and that's something that we um, will focus on. And nor are we able to measure the, the outcomes, the quality of the outcomes of the graduates. Many of you might have heard of the OECD's program um, called AHELLO, uh, the Assessment of Higher Education Learning Outcomes, which ran for how long, Marek? Ten years? No? It cost nine million dollars, and then they stopped it because they couldn't get agreement on how to take this forward. The idea was that you'd have international tests like the PISA test, which would enable you to assess the competencies that graduates come out with. Now, obviously, it's much more complicated at a higher education level than it is when you're testing literacy and maths and science skills at, at, with 15-year-olds. And even though the OECD didn't manage to complete this work, it's obvious that it's absolutely essential that we are able to really test the skills of graduates. At the moment, we work on the basis of suspicion that maybe Oxford and Cambridge, Imperial, Leiden, I'll say Utrecht as well, that they have a high level of competencies. Their graduates have a high level of competencies when they leave. And that maybe some other universities that you haven't heard of quite so much, the level is lower. Is that true? Is there really a difference between bachelor degrees from different countries? We have a very strong suspicion that there is, but at the moment we can't measure it. And that's something that we want to push forward um, to try to develop ways of, of measuring these competencies and to work with the universities to be able to do that. But in the end, the only way that you can improve the level of competencies of graduates is by investing in the teaching, by improving the teaching which is going on in, in universities. And one thing that strikes us is that in order to have a successful career in a university, the last thing you should do is spend your time teaching. It's very important to get published. We've all heard of publish or perish. It's very important to get published in the right journals. You know, to make sure that your citation index, your citation score is very high so that you get noticed. And that's the way you get tenure. That's the way you get to positions in, the, in your university. It's not from the student feedback that says, yeah, he or she is a great teacher and I've learned a lot with him or her. That needs to change. So we need to change the incentive structures for careers within universities so that people are rewarded for good teaching. But we also need to get universities themselves to invest in teaching and to get beyond this idea that just because you have a PhD, you're a great teacher. Because I think probably some of us here have come across cases where that's not necessarily the case. So again, here we want to work on this uh, together to try to identify some good practices that we found across Europe we know that there are countries where there is more investment in teaching skills in universities than in others. Uh, in the Netherlands now, there is a requirement that all university teachers have to have a basic teaching qualification. Uh, other initiatives in other countries, in Ireland, in the UK. Uh, but what we need to do is to try to network these initiatives to try to spread them to other member states and to try to see what really works. Does it really make a difference, for example, in the Netherlands that all of these people have now gone through this process of having a few hours of pedagogical training? Has it made a difference to the way they teach? Let's see. The other message, or another message that came back to us from our public consultation was about researchers, and in particular junior researchers in universities and how they felt that they were treated. I guess this is something that might have a resonance um, here. So
So more than half of the respondents, and not just the junior researchers, but more than half the respondents to our survey said that they felt that junior researchers were not supported to develop their potential during their PhD candidate period or in their postdoc period. So we have a problem here. The people that we desperately need in order to increase the, the competitiveness of our economy and the innovativeness of our society are not getting the support in research organizations and in, in universities that they need. One thing that goes along with that is looking at where our PhDs end up. If you look at the US, for example, 78% of people with a PhD are working in the private sector. In Japan, it's 74%, very close. In China already, to follow up on what Marek said, it's 62%. In Europe, it's 45%. We are training people to be researchers in universities. <coughs> and we certainly need them, but we need a lot more. We need a lot more people who are going out into industry, who are going out into the public sector, and who are making the difference in the way that we work, the way that we think, the way that we design policies, products, and services. Somebody man mentioned a challenge earlier on this afternoon about the way our universities are organized on the basis of sometimes highly independent faculties and how difficult it is to get them working with each other in an interdisciplinary way. Everybody talks about multidisciplinarity these days, as though we're all doing it, but we're not. And again, the survey told us that people felt that interdisciplinary work, not only was it not encouraged, it was quite often penalized. Why are you going outside talking to them? Stay here. Stay within your discipline. Get depth in your discipline. You don't want to be distracted by what's happening out there in the real world. And yet, in the real world, we need that interdisciplinarity because that's how the world works. We have another tool which some of you might have come across, which is called U-MultiRank, which is um, a, a ranking system for universities. It's a global system. It has about 12, 1,300 universities in it. Um, which, for the first time on an international scale, looks at areas beyond research. So it looks at the international profile of the universities, it looks at knowledge transfer, regional engagement, of teaching and learning, as well as the research side. But looking just at research, we asked them to try to identify which were the higher education institutions in Europe which were the most interdisciplinary in their research. It wasn't the big comprehensive research universities. It wasn't the League of European Research Universities, Mareg. It was the small, regional, sometimes technical universities who were working with businesses all the time, who were focused on solving real problems. They were the ones doing the interdisciplinary research. They have lessons that they can give to these big research universities about how to, uh, to deal with that, that aspect. And that is very important because it's in the interdisciplinarity field, it's in the areas between disciplines that you find innovation. That's where the new comes from, when you cross um, different fields uh, together. And we need to boost the role of higher education institutions in innovation uh, and entrepreneurship in particular. We have to build better systemic links between higher education institutions and their regions. There are some fantastic examples here and there around the place. Um, it's, still not, it's still not, unfortunately, uh, a generalization. And again, in our survey, we were 
disappointed to see that only 20% of the respondents, and that includes people representing universities, only 20% of them um, were convinced that higher education institutions play a strong role in innovation at regional and national level. So that's including the leaders of universities who are coming back with that view. So we have to do something about that, about supporting regional engagement of our universities. Now, I've spoken a lot about the economic role of universities, and Sasha will be very unhappy with that. And she's right to be unhappy, because higher education is not just about the labor market or competitiveness or innovation in products and services. It's not that. There's a reason, I think, that the European Union in particular has focused on this, and it's focused on, on that side of it in particular since 2008 and the um, economic and financial crisis. It focused on it because we saw that there was a massive problem of youth unemployment and that almost everything that the EU did was devoted to relaunching jobs and, and growth. I don't know if anybody's taking, yeah, you are, you're recording this, aren't you? So I have to be very careful about what I say now. Um, but I think that was a mistake. I think that was a mistake. And I think that what we have seen since in Europe in terms of social breakdown, of the rise of inequality, of disengagement of young people from political processes is in part a result of the over-focus that we have had in the education systems on the labor market. So we must not forget, and I think it's particularly important at the higher education level, but we must not forget that higher education has a social and socializing role alongside its economic contribution. So that means that higher education institutions have to be open to the surrounding community, so, and not just to the, to the labor market, but to civil society organizations, to cultural organizations. Uh, and and there are, again, there are many good examples uh, of this. But it's important also because this is what's important to the more diverse student body that we have these days. This is about ownership and engagement from students, as well as giving back to the communities. And I think that we see this particularly when we're talking now about the responsibility of the education systems to helping with the migration flow that we have at the moment, the refugee issue in at least some of the member states of the, of the European Union. Um, higher education has a very important role to play and in some cases is hampered from doing it by the regulatory system within which they operate. Regulation is one thing, funding is another. And we haven't really talked much about funding today. Um, but the sustainable funding of higher education is a real issue in, in many, many countries. We know that with the growth of the student population, the resources which are devoted to higher education have simply not kept pace. There are a couple of exceptions, maybe, in, in, in Europe. So there is enormous pressure on the universities because funding per student has fallen enormously. And even in countries where there has been a shift from public funding to private, you know, to very high tuition fees, for example, that still hasn't compensated for the growth in student numbers. But there's also pressure in order to ensure that there is better value, and this again is something that was mentioned earlier, there's better value um, obtained from every euro which is invested in the higher education system. So many countries are reforming their systems in order to try to tie their universities to various performance objectives. They're being paid by results rather than per student. These are experiments in many cases, and we have to see whether they make a difference. Some of them look more promising than others. But you really have to ask yourself, 
whether a performance system can really achieve its objectives in systems which are structurally underfunded. So there is a genuine problem of the level of funding as well as of the way the funding systems themselves are designed. So what can we do about that? Because the funding that we have, as welcome as it is to many European universities, is really only a drop in the ocean compared to the overall spending by national governments on, on higher education systems. What we can do is to provoke change, can provoke reform, by asking the difficult questions which often are not asked internally. We can provide support to the people who are, if you like, the troublemakers in the system. We can give weight to their views which they wouldn't have individually within a single country. And we can do it by looking at cross-country comparisons, by confronting ministries, ministers, with the results that other countries have achieved having changed their system. We use, for example, we have the Polish minister here, so I'll use this example. But we use very often the reforms that were carried out by the Polish government a few years ago in its education system, which, you'll forgive me, minister, which the Polish government has never attributed to European reforms, but which were very, very closely based on the European framework of key competences which everybody agreed that young people should achieve by the age of 15. That made a big difference to the educational outcomes of 15-year-olds in Poland, and the impact in the position of Poland in the PISA tables was really quite remarkable. I mean, moving from close to the bottom to above the European average now. There's going to be another reform now in Poland, I understand, of, of that system. So we're looking forward to see how that operates. That fact, being able to show the results of a reform in one country, enables us to work with other countries to say, this is what you could achieve too. Maybe the reforms won't be exactly the same, but if you don't do, if you don't do anything, you'll make no change, and this is what can, can actually help you. We can do that in higher education too, and we are going to focus in our work over the next few years on three main objectives. Firstly, to try and support the improvements in teaching and learning that I've mentioned. We will invest in skills forecasting, working with CEDIFOP. We will try to support projects between universities and the outside world in order to get this regional engagement. We will help with projects which um, look at how digitalization can be brought into the higher education field in a more uh, effective way, supporting teacher training, supporting the recognition of, um, of good teaching, and working on projects on producing engaged citizens. We'll focus on, as our second area, on regional innovation, trying to boost the role of universities as, as centers of regional innovation, working through the structural funds on smart specialization strategies, uh, and trying to reward, in particular, interdisciplinary work and intersectoral cooperation. And then finally, I want to mention as our third area something which has been worrying us for a couple of years, which is the apparent divorce that there has been in higher education institutions between research on the one hand and teaching on the other. I mentioned you know, the focus on research that, that we have. And it's fine, of course, to incentivize excellent research, we do it ourselves, we think that's extremely important, but it shouldn't be at the expense of teaching, and it shouldn't be at the expense of teaching which is based on the very latest research. The funding systems that we have in place at the moment tend to do that. They tend to produce a cadre of excellent researchers and a second rate of 
bank of teachers. And we need to, to change that um, completely. So we need to think of ways where we can help to overcome that problem. For example, by looking at the way the Marie Curie researcher mobility program works to build teaching support into that because we all know that our PhD candidates are probably going to be some of the first people that our undergraduate st students come across in terms of their learning experience. Um, and with our postdocs to give them teaching qualifications to prepare them for, um, uh, for better, uh, better teaching in future. And we also need to try to break down the very artificial barrier that we have at a European level between the European higher education area on the one hand and the European research area on the other. These are two worlds which in theory overlap to maybe 70 or 80 percent. In practice, these people never speak to each other. That needs to change. Now, we started with the 40th anniversary of the EUI. So what's, what can the EUI do? And I'll speak to the president uh, on this point. What can the EUI do? Well, first of all, you can carry on doing what you're doing now. Because the sort of activity that we have today, looking back at the history of where we have come from, and how we can move forward is extremely important in terms of developing new policies. It's very important to have the insights of Commissioner Marine, for example, in terms of what we were trying to do with the Erasmus program. There are not so many people who remember that these days. That's very important. But you're also a very strong postgraduate institute which has managed to keep together these two sides of research and teaching. You have experience there, which is important not just for the Institute, but for many peer organizations around Europe. And I hope that we can work together um, on that. In terms of innovation in education, the EUI has a very established reputation, very strong reputation. Sometimes people ask me, does it have a very innovative reputation? And I look around here, and I think, well, it's new, it's, it's refurbished. We have a screen. But maybe there are things that can be done at the EUI also in terms of networking, of um, interlinking, of actually coming out of the school on the hill in order to um, uh, to be more innovative in the way it's, it's working. And I'm very much looking forward to working with you on the new ideas for the School of Transnational Governance in that respect. You can also help us, I think, in terms of internationalization. You're a very international institute. One of the most international institutes of higher education, I think, that there is in, in, in Europe, maybe outside of University of Luxembourg, which is very, very special. They have to be. They have to be international by definition. Um, but again, there are things there that we can learn from in the way that you integrate international staff, in the way that you attract international students, in the way that you follow up, in particular, with your students. This is something that where we see a problem in many universities, that international students come and go and that the contact with them is very often lost. That's not what happens here. I'm not suggesting that we have an American system of alumni funding the, the university forever, but maybe the, the president is smiling, so maybe he's thinking about that too. So these are all areas where I think we can work together. Um, some areas where the institute is leading, some areas where it can um, develop. And I very much look, look forward to this uh, this modernization agenda for the Institute as well. 40th birthday. We used to say in English that life begins at 40. Now that longevity has increased so much, maybe it starts at 50 or 60 or maybe even higher. But it's certainly clear that the, the Institute is entering a new phase. Some very exciting things are happening. 
new changes, new schools being developed. And I hope that in 10 years' time, when we reach the half century, we'll be able to look back at this anniversary to say that was the time that we entered this new phase. That was the time when new developments started and where we formed the basis of what is going to be a very long and very sex successful relationship between the EUI, the Member States, and the European Union. Thank you very much for having me.